ask anyone what is the best acting performance of the 21st century, and many would reply, Heath Ledger's portrayal of the Joker in The Dark Knight. This performance was unfortunately overshadowed by the actor's tragic death before the movie was released. Suicide? Accident? Many rumors have spread about the cause of his death. This tragedy encouraged a generation of movie viewers to explore the filmography of an often underrated actor who dedicated himself to his craft and managed to make a lasting impact on film history. But behind his beauty and talent hide a more tormented soul, passionate and excessive, discreet and tortured by insomnia. From his youth in Australia to his first blockbusters, from teen comedies to critical praise, from drug use to tragic death, let's explore who Heath Ledger really was. Keith Ledger was born in Perth, Australia in 1979. His mother was a French teacher and his father was a race car driver. He and his sister Kate were named after the two main characters of the Emily Bronte classic, Wuthering Heights. Early in life, Ledger found a passion for playing chess and at the age of 10, he won Western Australia's Junior Chess Championship and he also became quickly interested in becoming a stage performer. He was very close to his older sister Kate, who was acting on stage at her school around that time. She later described how her brother was mesmerized by this theatrical world. He attended every one of his sister's performances. That's how she inspired his calling for acting, as well as his love for dancer and actor Gene Kelly. He began acting and, at 13, he performed the lead role in Guildford Grammar School's production of Peter Pan. Acting and dancing became an emotional release for Ledger, and he he kept seeking out roles in his grammar school. He also managed to get a small part in a TV series called Ship to Shore in 1993, when he was only 14 years old. After passing his graduation exams at age 17, Ledger left school to pursue an acting career. At the age of 17, after he left high school, he drove across the country, which was quite a significant drive from Perth to Sydney, uh, and began getting roles in Australian film and television. He starred on a few different Australian teen series, one of them was called Sweat, where he played played a uh, young gay athlete, and that was kind of interesting for the time in the 1990s. There weren't that many gay characters on television in any country, and of course, it had an interesting asterisk in Heath Ledger's career going forward, where he became extremely famous and really his breakthrough role was also playing a gay character in Brokeback Mountain. He was uh, willing and able to break through those barriers and, and, and play against taboos that existed, that still exist today, but were even stronger you know, 20 years ago. After several small roles on television, Ledger's film debut came with the drama Black Rock. This film was quickly followed by a starring role in the historic series Roar. The show was nominated for several awards and exposed Ledger to American audiences and to studio executives. However well known he was up until 1999, he was known as a promising Australian screen actor, film and television actor, who didn't have a huge amount of international renown, if any at all, actually. His then-girlfriend, actress Lisa Zane, advised Ledger to seek out an American agent and to follow her to Los Angeles at the age of 19, and it's exactly what he did. In America, his career quickly took off. As early as 1999, Ledger was exposed to an international audience with his breakout role in 10 Things I Hate About You. The rom-com was a cult success. He got that breakthrough because there was just this span, this swath of production that was happening around that time. Unlike other actors who got their start in teen movies, he, he didn't make a career of it. That was really the only one that he did. He got good reviews, he got some good career traction off of it, and he was able to build on that to bigger and better things. Things happened quickly for Ledger. Despite his young age, he was soon beating out the Hollywood elite for major roles in blockbuster films. He was cast in The Patriot as a supporting actor alongside another Australian star, Mel Gibson. His Ledger was a, a little bit contested uh, at the beginning because uh, I um, had tested him against another guy together with Mel and everybody was actually more in favor of the other guy. Uh, but he's had something very noble. There was something amazingly noble about him. And um, I had to call Mel Gibson because he was also supporting the other actor. And then after three week, uh, three days of shooting, you know, he said, came to me and said, you were right, I was wrong. This kid is amazing and he will go very, very far. There was this sense of, well, Mel Gibson is one generation of Australian-American heartthrob and now, Here's the passing of the baton. Here's 
bringing this new generation into it. And I think that is something that really does speak to a huge and important factor in Heath Ledger's career, which is that he always had the support of the Hollywood system. It was a dream come true for Ledger to play along Gibson, but he was nervous. Was he going to be up to the task? His agent recalled he had a confidence crisis during the shoot of the film. This fear of not being good enough never left him during his entire career. But of course, Ledger's talent had the upper hand. His talent was also tested in the lower budget drama Monster's Ball, opposite Billy Bob Thornton and Halle Berry. He also showcased his leading man abilities in the action film A Knight's Tale. His exposure in these films, coupled with his growing reputation as a Hollywood playboy, led People magazine to name Ledger one of its 50 most beautiful people in 2001. After A Knight's Tale, Ledger worked steadily on independent films as a leading actor. These were films that were made on fairly limited budgets that were still a little bit larger scale than those teen movies that he made in Australia and then had his breakthrough in America. But they were just tryout movies. You call that tryout movies. They were rolling the dice, seeing if, well, if we put this guy in the lead of a film, will audiences come out? Will he become a leading man? They weren't putting all of their eggs in the basket that was Heath Ledger, but there was certainly enough industry confidence in him. They kept on giving him starring roles in limited productions to see if, is he a viable movie star? People thought they knew who Heath Ledger was. His career seemed already settled. He was a sex symbol, an action movie star. He was seen as a good-looking leading man, but he wasn't necessarily seen as an extremely powerful actor but he was about to show the world his true depth as an actor in a movie that moved an entire generation. It was in 2005 that everything changed. Ang Lee casted him, alongside Jake Gyllenhaal, to star in Brokeback Mountain. In the film, Ledger plays ranch hand Ennis Del Mar, who has a lifelong love affair with aspiring rodeo rider Jack Twist. Well, the reason I knew I could play Innes is I knew Innes had a hard time coming to grips with his sexuality, coming to grips with the fact that he had love for Jack Twist. And I knew I would find it hard having to portray those scenes myself. I knew I would personally, and not being gay, I knew that would be a challenge for me. And I knew that I could use that to my advantage. All of a sudden, with the success of Brokeback Mountain, with the critical success of Brokeback Mountain, the bets paid off. This was the movie star that Hollywood was waiting for. But more importantly, the movie fought for gay rights and created a scandal in an era of intolerance and homophobia. You know, in 2004, George W. Bush runs for re-election, and one of his major campaign platforms was a ban on gay marriage. There was a lot more resistance to gay rights, there was a lot more ho outward homophobia and acceptable homophobia in the national discourse. And so when Brokeback Mountain comes out only one year later, you know, Brokeback Mountain became a very culturally important film at a time when just the narratives around gay love and gay life were extremely political and extremely fraught. Ledger received a Golden Globe nomination for Best Actor in a Drama and an Academy Award nomination for Best Actor for his performance, making him, at age 26, the ninth youngest nominee for a Best Actor Oscar. The actor was at the top of his game, but this movie didn't only bring him praise, he also met actress Michelle Williams on the set. The two immediately began a relationship, and Williams gave birth to their daughter, Matilda Rose, a year later. And her godfather is none other than Jake Gyllenhaal. Ledger and Williams moved in together in Brooklyn and lived there for two years. But in 2007, it was confirmed that the couple had ended their relationship. Rumors circulated that Williams asked Ledger to move out of their apartment because of his drug use. But more about that later. Meanwhile, Ledger's career was still blooming. He plays in a film called Candy. And Candy, I guess you could say, starts the second phase of his career. It's no longer just the heartthrob, no longer the promising leading man. It's, oh, this is the first film that he made as Heath Ledger, the serious actor. It was a film about drug addiction. It was a film about heroin addicts. It was a film about the fraught relationship between uh, two addicts and the way that that tears their relationship apart. You see odd foreshadowings. You see drug addiction. You see young men who die before their time. After Ang Lee, another important director took notice of Ledger's talent, Todd Haynes. The director of the celebrated film, Carol, asked Ledger to be one of the six actors embodying an aspect of the life of Bob Dylan in his movie, I'm Not There. 
While he was exploring new paths in his acting career, he was also searching for new love. After his breakup with Williams, the tabloid press linked Ledger with supermodels Helena Christensen and Gemma Ward. But tragedy was getting closer. At that time, Ledger had only a year left to live. This year would make him immortal though, thanks to his most powerful work as an actor. In his penultimate performance, Ledger played the Joker in Christopher Nolan's 2008 film The Dark Knight. But when Christopher Nolan announced he had cast Heath Ledger, the reaction was almost unanimously negative. The studio executives were confused by that choice, and the fans were even harsher on Ledger. There was some portion of people that were saying, well, you know, Heath Ledger is a promising young actor. Wait and see. There were other people that said, well, like, this was the guy that was playing the hunk four years ago. How could he play the Joker? But nobody was thrilled about it, and nobody was excited about it. How is he gonna play the Joker? Because there was really nothing in his career up to that point that really fit that box. When asked the reason for this unexpected casting, Nolan simply replied, because Heath is fearless. I had an idea of what the Joker would be in the world we'd created of Batman Begins. And to me, it was creating a sort of psychologically credible anarchist, um, a force of anarchy, a force of chaos, a, a purposeless criminal. I met with Heath, and um, he really seemed to relate to what I was talking about. He seemed to understand how this character could be extraordinarily frightening and fresh and, and different than, than anything that had been done before. While working on the film in London, Ledger told the New York Times that he viewed the Dark Knight's Joker as a psychopathic, mass-murdering, schizophrenic clown who lives in a society and has zero empathy, but also described it as the most fun I've ever had, or probably ever will have, playing a character. He prepared intensively for the role and put in every effort to set his performance apart from his predecessors. He isolated himself in a hotel room in order to cultivate an entirely new character, I sat around in a hotel room in London for about a month, locked myself away, formed a little diary and experimented with voices. His diary, composed of texts and pasted pictures, would become the Joker diary that he would bring on set to leap through in order to get into character. Ledger also became heavily involved with the painting of his face. Apparently, Ledger and makeup artist John Caglioni gravitated toward a Francis Bacon painting that Nolan had recommended as inspiration for the Joker's makeup. Nolan went into more detail about how the makeup design helped flesh out Ledger's Joker character. We have a Francis Bacon spin to his face. This corruption, this decay in the texture of the look itself, it's grubby. You can almost imagine what he smells like. But his intense work on the role had taken a toll on his ability to sleep. Ledger had a long history of sleep troubles, reportedly struggling with a racing mind for years before portraying the Joker. However, his chronic insomnia became much more prevalent and aggressive after filming The Dark Knight. Last week, I probably slept an average of two hours a night. I couldn't stop thinking. My body was exhausted and my mind was still going. You know, this is in the public record that he was somebody that was fraught with bouts of insomnia, that he was somebody that had a hard time sleeping, that had a hard time remaining calm, that had a hard time finding some sort of inner peace. And that was something that he looked to combat with prescription medication. This is, this is, this is true, we know this, this has been reported. He did self-medicate uh, because of whatever it might be, inner demons, perhaps. He certainly was fraught with insomnia, he certainly had a hard time being still, finding inner stillness, inner peace. His hyperactivity, his lack of sleep, Ledger put it to good use. He was, according to everyone that knew him, a truly creative person, never resting, always seeking new ways to express himself. A little known fact about Ledger is his passion for filmmaking. In fact, Ledger's close friends and family members describe Ledger as being more comfortable behind the camera than in front of it. He was always bringing cameras with him everywhere he went, experimenting while filming himself. He even made a career as a music video director. He worked with artists such as Ben Harper and Modest Mouse. He also made videos to go alongside music of the late musician Nick Drake. Who was a British musician who died of an overdose in the 1970s. And so, again, his musical uh, career, his career as a music video director, clearly shows that he had interest in investigating the darker corners of the human experience, that that was something that he found artistically fulfilling, that he found artistically rewarding, and that he thought 
he wanted to pursue uh, as a director, both of music videos and of films that sort of never came into being, was that work on his directorial debut, uh, his fiction directorial debut, which was an adaptation of a book that was, interestingly enough, about drug addiction in the chess world, <laughs> but a chess prodigy who falls into addiction. And that itself, again, gave him that additional aura of myth when viewing his life in the past tense. Once finished with his work on The Dark Knight, Ledger started working on the Terry Gilliam project, The Imaginarium of Dr. Panassis. In January 2008, while he was apparently suffering from some kind of respiratory illness, he reportedly complained to his co-star, Christopher Plummer, that he was continuing to have difficulty sleeping and taking pills to help him with that problem. Plummer reported, We all caught colds because we were shooting outside on horrible damp nights. But heats went on and I don't think he dealt with it immediately with the antibiotics. I think what he did have was the walking pneumonia. He was saying all the time, damn it, I can't sleep. And he was taking all these pills to help him. In talking with Interview Magazine after his death, Ledger's former fiance, Michelle Williams, also confirmed reports the actor had experienced trouble sleeping. For as long as I'd known him, he had had bouts with insomnia. He had too much energy. His mind was turning, 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 always turning. And it's this abuse of various drugs that reportedly led the actress to ask him to leave the apartment they were sharing. During a break from shooting the Imaginarium of Dr. Parnassus, Heath flew back to New York to rest. He was in New York. He'd returned from a holiday vacation in Australia, where he'd seen his family for, I suppose, the last time. He had come from the set of the Imaginarium of Dr. Parnassus. Where he was in the middle of shooting. He was having some downtime in his apartment in January 2008. He was obviously plagued by some of the health issues, the insomnia, the, the, the pneumonia, the, the head cold, whatever it was, that he chose to uh, combat by self-medicating. He had access to too many prescription medications that came into conflict with one another, and that, that was it. On January 22, 2008, his masseuse, Diana Wollison, went to Ledger's loft in the Soho neighborhood of Manhattan. She arrived at 3 o'clock p.m., but she found the actor unconscious in his bed. Wollison called Ledger's friend Mary-Kate Olson for help. Olson, who was in California, directed a New York City private security guard to go to the scene. At 3.26 p.m., Wollison telephoned 911 to say that Ledger was not breathing. At the urging of the 911 operator, Wollison administered CPR, which was unsuccessful in reviving him. At 3.36 p.m., Ledger was pronounced dead and his body was removed from the apartment. It's believed that the young star's death was caused by an overdose of the sleep aid combined with various other prescription drugs found in his system post-mortem. There are questions as to whether friends helped him procure these drugs or not. Again, the fact that he died gives it this aura of tragic inevitability, but it really was just something that happened and it could have not, it could have just as easily not. The coroner's report ruled his death an accident. Before his passing, Heath Ledger completed filming The Dark Knight. Speaking of editing the movie, the director Christopher Nolan recalled, it was tremendously emotional right when he passed, having to go back in and look at him every day. But the truth is, I feel very lucky to have something productive to do to have a performance that he was very, very proud of and that he had entrusted to me to finish. So Heath Ledger dies in January, January 22nd, 2008. The Dark Knight doesn't come out for another six months. You know, Dark Knight was still being edited when Heath Ledger dies. And so you can't rob the film, you cannot separate the film from his death. You know, at no point in the history of The Dark Knight did anybody ever see the movie with Heath Ledger being alive. His death informs the performance. When you watch the Joker, you're not just looking at the Joker, you're looking at a ghost. This is somebody that has come from beyond the grave. It was not, un, it was not knowingly made to play into, but plays into the trauma and the circumstances of his passing in a way that made the film such a cultural phenomenon. I don't think that The Dark Knight would be The Dark Knight without Heath Ledger. I don't think that The Dark Knight would be The Dark Knight without the fact that it came out six months after Heath Ledger's death. Released in July 2008, The Dark Knight broke several box office records and received both popular and critical accolades, especially with regard to Ledger's performance as the Joker. His performance took the audience and the fans by surprise. No one expected Ledger to make this popular character his own. But shortly after his death, widespread speculations were made that Ledger's performance as the Joker had, in some way, led to his death. 
the myth making begins. You know, it begins, the first thing that happens is Jack Nicholson says, I told him. Or that apparently when the Jack Nicholson played the Joker in the 1989 Batman, he had some hard, he had a hard time getting over the role. He found the role to be mentally scarring. He didn't necessarily relish the part itself. And that quote, I told him, kind of explodes. It goes viral in the, you know, in the early internet of 2008. Um, and people find other interviews where Heath Ledger talks about having insomnia. People find other interviews where Heath Ledger talks about um, you know, the, troubled, the troubles that he has on a personal level. And it all becomes this story. It all becomes this narrative in the media, this narrative online that playing the Joker destroyed him. To dispel these exaggerated rumors, Ledger's co-star and friend Christian Bale, who played opposite him as Batman, has insisted that, as an actor, Ledger greatly enjoyed meeting the challenges of creating that role. Director Terry Gilliam also refuted the claims that playing the Joker made him crazy, calling it absolute nonsense, and going on to say, Heath was so solid, his feet were on the ground, and he was the least neurotic person I've ever met. In December 2008, it was announced that Ledger had been nominated for a Golden Globe Award for Best Supporting Actor for The Dark Knight. He subsequently won the award with director Christopher Nolan accepting on his behalf. And his co-stars Maggie Gyllenhaal, Michael Caine, Christian Bale, and many of Ledger's colleagues in the film community called for a nomination for the 2008 Academy Award for Best Supporting Actor in recognition of Ledger's achievement. Ledger's subsequent nomination was announced on January 22, 2009. And Ledger made history since he went on to win the Academy Award for Best Supporting Actor. He's actually the second uh, actor to ever win a posthumous Oscar. Now, the first actor to win a posthumous Oscar died in between being nominated and winning. Heath Ledger gets nominated for the Oscar on January 22nd, 2009. So he's nominated a year to the day after his death when he wins the Oscar in, I suppose, February or March of 2009. He had been dead for, you know, over a year. And so it really was this celebratory and mournful end uh, to his career. And his family came on stage to collect the Academy Award. And it happened so long after his passing that it was seen as a, uh, a memorial event to, uh, to his life and to, to all that he represented. Following talks with the Ledger family in Australia, the Academy determined that Ledger's daughter, Matilda Rose, would own the award. At the time of his death, Ledger was filming another movie, Terry Gilliam's The Imaginarium of Dr. Parnassus. Heath Ledger dies in the middle of the shoot. We had been shooting for uh, four weeks. We just finished in London. We were heading off to Vancouver. We finished the night shooting. Heath gets on a plane and goes to New York. I go to Vancouver and on Tuesday, He's no longer with us. Scenes that placed Ledger in a realistic world had been completed in London. After his passing, the film production was shut. But Terry Gilliam decided to finish the movie as an homage so that Ledger's final performance could be seen in theaters. He was part of our, part of my family. He was, yeah, it was extraordinary. We were very close. Ledger's role was recast to have new actors portray his physically transformed versions in a magical realm. He always had a lot of industry support around him. People really liked him and were betting on him and he had a lot of Hollywood friendships and support. And that's something that marks him from the beginning in Hollywood uh, with the Patriot, all the way to his final role after he dies halfway through the shooting of the Imaginary of Dr. Parnassus. Three big stars, Johnny Depp, Colin Farrell, and Jude Law come in to finish his role. What was amazing is because, again, I chose people that were very close to Heath. They knew him, they knew what it, what it was about. We put them in there and they kind of became what the character could be. And because the character was such a multifaceted character, he was a con man, you could be different each time. So why not, when you go through the mirror, he doesn't have to look the same. So we were lucky that Heath was loved by a lot of great actors. <laughs> and uh, that's a I don't want to do that one again. <laughs> that's, that particular solution on uh, 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 problem solving, we don't have to go through that one again. And the three actors donated their fees for the film to Ledger's and William's daughter, Matilda Rose. We have told the story of an actor whose career continued after his passing. It brings Ledger close to another icon, James Dean, who also died before his biggest successes came out. Heath Ledger only made a few films, and he only worked for 10 years in the film industry before making a lasting impact in Hollywood. But this hyperactive, mega-talented actor made the most out of his time on Earth. 
he was loved by all in the industry, and he is now immortal thanks to his performance as the Joker. During his career, he could have chosen the easy path and become a Hollywood star like many others, cashing in on his previous successes. But he kept searching for something else. I never figured out who Heath Ledger is on film. People always feel compelled to sum you up, to presume that they have you and can describe you. That's fine. But there are so many stories inside of me and a lot I want to achieve outside of one flat note. In 2019, a new Joker movie was released, starring Joaquin Phoenix, and once again, Heath Ledger was on everyone's mind because of how much he impacted that role. It's been many years since he left us, but his talent and charm will live on through his films.